Uh, good morning. I'm Commissioner uh, Bud Blake, and I'll be presiding over today's appeal. Um, i just let you know that today's hearing is being recorded and will be televised at a later date. Um, seated to my left is Commissioner Gary Edwards, and seated to my right is Commissioner Hutchings. And just for the record, today is May 3rd, 2017, and it's approximately 10.30 a.m. in the morning. Uh, the Thurston County Board of Commissioners is now on the record in an appeal filed by Patrick and Catherine Townsend and Annika Jensen of the hearing examiner's decision dated on February 17, 2017. This decision approved, subject to conditions, Mr. Stone's application for a shoreline substantial development permit to develop an intertidal gooey duck aquaculture operation on 1.1 acres of private tide lands and addressed in the block of 76th Avenue, Northwest Olympia. This issue before the Board of County Commissioners today is whether the evidence presented uh, at the hearing examiners discriminate, dis demonstrated that Mr. Stone's application complied with the applic applicable shoreline substantial development permit criteria. I'll make a de declaration for the record that I have reviewed the examiner's decision uh, dated from 17 February 2017 and the applicable evidence presented to the examiner. I have not yet visited the site, but I plan to do so. And I've reread the uh, docket, um, not in its entirety, but enough to be able to move forward with today's decision, or with, with today's hearing. Um, with that in mind, I'll ask my two seatmates um, if they plan to visit the site and how they have read the docket. Um, I have... Uh uh, reviewed applicable portions of the record. I have not visited the site uh, and I've not had any ex parte communication with any of the parties to the appeal. I have uh, visited the area. I'm, I'm familiar with the area. And I have had ex parte communications with the party to this appeal about the substance of this case or a relationship with one of the parties and therefore am recusing myself from this position of uh, judicial okay. position. So at this point in time you are recusing yourself? Yes. And so there will be two who have not, uh, ha have not had any ex parte communication. And I'd like to ask Elizabeth to explain. Uh, Elizabeth is the uh, Deputy Prosecutor Attorney, Attorney to the uh, Board of County Commissioners, and she's going to explain how um, Mr. Edwards has recused himself and the continuation of that. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Blake. Yes, the, um, the doctrine at issue here is called the Appearance of Fairness, Appearance of Fairness Doctrine, which applies to quasi-judicial appeals in the land use arena. What Commissioner Edwards has just shared is that he has had some communications with some of the parties and he has a, a familial relationship with another one of the parties. And as a result of those um, communications and relationships, he is um, recusing himself um, to allow a, a, an appearance of fairness in the continued proceedings before the board today. Uh, while he is recusing himself, um, he is also going to be uh, listening to the arguments. And the reason for that is, is because there's another doctrine called the doctrine of necessity in the event that the two commis remaining commissioners, Commissioner Blake and Commissioner Hutchings, are not able to come to a decision together, then com uh, Commissioner Edwards will be pulled back in only at that time to vote, uh, cast the tie-breaking vote. But that only happens if the uh, two commissioners that are hearing the case and not recusing themselves cannot come to an agreement on the appropriate decision in this matter. Okay. Thank you very much. So just kind of uh, recap, uh, Commissioner Hutchins and I have not had any ex parte communications with any of the parties uh, that are related to this appeal. However, uh, I just want to ask the question on the table, do any of the parties have any objections or challenges for any of the board members that have made the decisions with his recusal and our uh, decla declaration of ex parte. No? Okay. So we'll move into the oral arguments. The oral arguments are um, by the parties represented here. 
Uh, the parties have requested the opportunity to present an oral argument. The oral argument may not present new information or evidence, but must be limited to the evidence on the record and the specific issues raised in the appellant's appeal. Each party has a total of 15 minutes uh, for their argument. Uh, the appellants shall, be, shall proceed first, and uh, they have the option of reserving five minutes of their 15 minutes for the rebuttal, rebuttal portion. Uh, then the applicant shall have 15 minutes for argument. The board, if any questions are asked, will ask any questions at that time during or after the argument. Uh, do, the, uh, do any of the parties have any uh, questions before we begin the formal portion? No? So I'll ask the... Uh, Uh, can you hear me out? Difficult. It might be my voice. <coughs> okay, sure, I'll swallow the mic, but uh, nonetheless, we're going to move forward. <laughs> so, nonetheless, uh, the appellant is first, and so I'd ask that person or persons to come to the podium and proceed forward. Swallow the mic. Yeah. Uh, commissioners, good morning. Hey, um, I will not be reserving five minutes, so I'll just do my presentation. So the and, full 15 uh, minutes? Yeah, the full 15 sure. minutes. How's that? A little yeah. bit better? Okay. Um, well, thank you for granting us some time to talk to you today about an issue that's critical for us in the community that we're in. My name is Patrick Townsend. Uh, I'm an appellant in the matter before the board today. Uh, the other appellants are my wife, Catherine Townsend, and Annika Jensen whose uh, Tideland, all of our Tideland, about the applicant's Tideland in Zangle Cove. All of our Tidelands about one another in Zangle Cove. It's a close community. We're next to each other, and they do uh, connect. Um, this is a picture here of the aerial picture of the Tideland. You can see it's a V-shaped uh, uh, area, uh, and I'll, I'll be talking about that just a little bit. We're here to appeal the granting of a substantial development uh, permit to the applicant on his Tidelands in Zangle Cove in Boston Harbor. Uh, it is our belief that the county erred in granting the permit uh, and the hearings examiner erred in reaffirming the permit on review. Uh, I'll make reference today to portions of the Shoreline Management Act and the Thurston County Shoreline Master Pro Plan. All these references were detailed in our original uh, appeal to you and that appeal is attached to the document that I'll provide to you uh, after this. So I'll provide my notes today to you in, uh, in writing. Uh, just a few facts when we start. Uh, Zangle Cove is a freshwater estuary uh, within the community of Boston Harbor, uh, which is seven miles from Olympia, almost uh, directly north. Uh, according to research by Thurston County Title, uh, dating back to the early 1900s, uh, there is no history of commercial aquaculture uh, in Boston Harbor or Zangle Cove, uh, as claimed by the applicant. Approximately 130 people submitted comments during the comment process uh, to the county opposing this operation, and a 70-signature petition opposing the operation from the Boston Harbor community was also submitted. We fundamentally disagree that the applicant's characterization of our concerns uh, and the interpretation, his interpretation of the Shoreline Management Act. So four basic areas were allowed under the appeal. Uh, so I want to talk just briefly about each of those. The information here was a part of the uh, 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 appeals process. So the first is eelgrass. Uh, eelgrass is a critical species uh, for the food web in Puget Sound. That's probably an understatement. Um, it provides an important habitat for juvenile salmon and other species. Zangle Cove is unique in South Puget Sound because of natively recruited eelgrass. Thus, Zangle Cove has been included in the Puget Sound-wide eelgrass restoration project, uh, begun in 2013, managed by DNR and Battelle, and funded by the U.S. Department of Energy and, of course, all of us as taxpayers. Dr. Jeffrey Gakel of DNR has monitored eelgrass in Zangle Cove since 2006. Uh, our expert, uh, David Batker, testified that eelgrass can come and go, uh, moving around from one location to another in a particular given area. It can come, it can disappear, it can come back, it can move locations. Eelgrass was documented by Dr. Gakel in 2007 on or directly adjacent to the applicant's tideland. 
In eelgrass-rich areas of North Puget Sound, uh, such as Samish Bay, the applicant referred to, as the applicant referred to in testimony, a small buffer around the eelgrass to protect it may be sufficient. Uh, in Zangle Cove, a small buffer may be completely inadequate to protect the eelgrass, this critical species, because of the tenuous existence of eelgrass in South Puget Sound and this area in particular. This is an important distinction regarding eelgrass and eelgrass restoration that was not properly addressed. The Shoreline Management Act mandates that long-term benefits take precedence over short-term benefits. Uh, all of us in business understand this in our bones, this is, that this makes sense. Eelgrass restoration is critical to the long-term health of South Puget Sound. Uh, Goo duck operations have no long-term benefits and are especially detrimental to eelgrass, we believe, in South Puget Sound. The second issue dealt with plastics. It's difficult to grasp the scope of the use of plastics in a gooey duck operation. Uh, in this case, approximately 48,000 PVC pipes will be put in as predator protection, uh, according to the applicant's uh, biological evaluation. This is over seven miles of pipe, weighing about 16 tons. It's really an, inc uh, an incredible amount of pipe. It's enough pipe to run approximately from Boston Harbor to Olympia. Uh, additionally, the pipes are then covered uh, with a heavy plastic netting and staked with rebar. The entire acre will be covered, pipes will be covered with plastic netting. The PVC pipe used for these operations is not rated for marine use or residential drinking water use. We, in truth, we have no idea of the long-term and cumulative impacts of toxics from plastics uh, on water quality, habitat, on the creatures in the food web. Applicant states that they use PVC from 1998 forward. They use it over and over again. And it's manufactured, which was manufactured nearly 20 years ago now. This greatly increases the chance of degradation and leaching of harmful substances. Yet it is the simple magnitude of PVC that is mind boggling. This is one operation seven miles of PVC in an acre of Tideland. It's a bit absurd that authorities allow this and then turn around and insist that citizens like us in Boston Harbor contribute to the effort to restore Puget Sound. The third issue uh, that was under uh, consideration uh, was recreation. Zangle Cove resident residents enjoy boating, beach walking, and swimming. And Zangle Cove is, pri is a primary recreational destination from the nearby Boston Harbor Marina, and other areas of Puget Sound. The Boston Harbor Marina rents kayaks, canoes, sailboats, and paddle boards. They come by our house all the time. A public launch area <coughs> next to the marina provides all citizens in Thurston County an op opportunity to do the same thing, to bring their own gear, and get on the water, and enjoy it. Um, an industrial operation in Zangle Cove is a recreational hazard. If you've been on a kayak, you, you will know, and you can imagine 48,000 pieces of pipe and netting, you can imagine this. The county and hearings examiner erred by ignoring the fact that the Shoreline Management Act encourages activities that provide the widest level of benefit for all citizens, in preference to limited and short-term benefits like those of a gooey duck farm. The fourth issue was aesthetics. Um, the proposed project is in the immediate view of 15 or more property owners, some who have lived there more than 60 years. The hearings examiner and the applicant cannot arbitrarily define aesthetics for an entire neighborhood. Zangle Cove residents pay high property taxes for the privilege, and it is a privilege, of living in an aesthetically valuable area and have every right to strongly object to an industrial operation in our front yards, literally in our front yards. The applicant dismisses the visibility of the operation by averaging the visibility over the year. The fact is the operation will almost never be visible from October through March uh, because the lowest tides are in the night. Yeah. So in, in, uh, in, in some cases that there be, may be a month where these tubes are not actually visible at all in the winter. Uh, in summer, the lowest tides are during the day. We have long days and the lowest tides are during the day. And the operation will be visible 
for approximately 84% of the days between April and September. This is the high use period of time for this area. Uh, and MEC visibility can be up to five hours a day. The applicant's uh, visibility analysis does not include harvest activities, you know, barges and workers and sometimes dive operations. These are not included, but they haven't. The Shoreline Management Act gives precedence to aesthetics and the long-term benefits of aesthetic enjoyment. So I have a few additional uh, points and then I'll summarize. Um, first is that Zangle Cove is a unique shoreline neighborhood with high recreational use and the site of a Puget Sound uh, wide eelgrass restoration project. According to our expert witness, David Backer, recreation is of far more economic, economic value than a gooey duck farm. Number two, the county does not know where all gooey duck farms are located in Thurston County. No county permits exist for the four gooey duck operations quite close by to Zangle Cove. This is, came out in testimony. Uh, the fact is, we do not know how much of this activity is taking place in Thurston County. No permits for gooey duck operations in, is our opinion that no permits should be further granted for gooey duck operations until that is well known. The Thurston County should be able to document the presence of all these farms and they should be properly permitted. That is not the case today. Third, the idea that gooey ducks clean the water is a myth. The fact is that gooey duck operators require clean water to get a permit. It's a fundamental requirement to do this kind of operation. The only reason that Dr. Son can contemplate a gooey duck operation on his Thailand is because the Boston Harbor sewer system has given us clean water in Zangle Cove. Community members each made a large initial investment in the sewer system, as well as we make ongoing monthly payments and contribution to this system. And you know what? It's a miracle. It worked. We went from a, a community with very poor water quality because of septic systems to one where the water quality is really excellent. excellent. And that opened up this opportunity. Dr. Son and his operation is not on the sewer system, mm -hmm. uh, so the community is basically subsidizing his operation at a high cost per household. The Zangle Code, fourth, the Zangle Code uh, Gooey Duck operation will be in the front yard of some 15 uh, longtime property owners in Boston Harbor. So the applicant <coughs> attempted to compare Zangle Cove to the permitted Haley Farm in, per in uh, Pierce County, another Gooey Duck operation. The Haley Farm is on a straight beach with a high bank and no immediate neighbors. On Zangle Cove, there are 29 households within 600 feet of the operation and 15 with a direct view. Ironically, the applicant lives on a high bank and will likely not see his own operation. Number five, the hearings examiner granted a routine illegal trespass onto neighboring tidelands as one of the mitigating conditions for the industry to pick up aquaculture trash. Things get loose, they move around. She also authorized trespass by allowing the impacts of harvesting, the sediment that may flow up to 300 feet from the harvest site onto neighbor's tidelands. Gooey duck, harvest utilizes high, gooey duck harvesting techniques utilize high pressure stinger hoses to dredge the sediment to a depth of three feet. These two types of trespass would never be acceptable on upland property. They just wouldn't. And we don't believe that there is legal justification for the county to mandate or allow such trespass or grant this type of easement. Sixth, according to uh, Mr. John Marshall, uh, who's a Boston Harbor historian, tribal fishermen have, some, have come to Zangle Cove each fall for at least 26 years to fish for the annual run of coho and Chinook salmon. that They run right into the cove. They consider Zangle Cove their historic fishing ground. They traditionally set their weighted seine nets in the area at the applicant's Thailand. Protruding PVC, rebar, and nets would interfere with the salmon, salmon harvest. Because, uh, number seven, because gooey ducks are primarily exported, there is almost no tax benefit to the county. Recreation is far more valuable. Yet Thurston County supports uh, transforming tidelands, the nurseries of Puget Sound, into gooey duck feedlots. Number eight, and I just have two more points. Uh, the permitting of a gooey duck operation in Zangle Cove is but a stepping stone to the next gooey duck operation. The argument that Zangle Cove is small and no one will notice is a tall tale. The entire community will notice and strongly objects to the alteration of Zangle Cove. 
please read the dissent of Shoreline Hearings Board's member in our responsive memorandum submitted on April 21. Quote, I am concerned that this decision will be looked to as a precedent for approval of other projects. That concern is well borne out. And that's from um, the SH, uh, SHB uh, member Dave Summers. Number nine, and last point, uh, the hearing examiner failed to grasp that an industrial operation in Zangle Cove is a fundamental operation of the, uh, uh, alteration of the ecosystem from a natural balance of organisms to a monoculture. Because gooey ducks live up to 168 years, some older than Washington statehood, removing all native gooey ducks is equivalent to clear cutting an old growth forest. Once the tideland is clear cut, and densely replanted with laboratory-raised gooey duck seed, the ecology of the beach will never be the same. In summary, uh, this project uh, impacts our entire community as well as visitors to the area. We understand the importance uh, of aquaculture to Washington State and acknowledge that aquaculture has a place. That place is not Zangle Cove. We believe that for the reasons we've talked about today, the mitigating conditions of the original permit and those added by the hearings examiner are not adequate to protect our, our, this, our, our cove. Can I just have a couple more seconds? Just two, two or three seconds, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So we ask that the uh, commissioners uh, deny this permit outright. We think there's fundamentally good reasons to do so. Alternatively, if the permit proceeds, we believe the county erred in establishing a mitigated determination of non-significance. Uh, we should, we ask for uh, a, a, term, a determination of significance and a full environmental impact study for this area. There is probably not another project I can think of that more cries out for a full analysis of the impact. Okay. So uh, thank you uh, for your time and your attention. I notice we have some folks here from the community. I just would like to ask them to stand in a moment of silence, just stand to be recognized. I'm not gonna let that happen. I want you to hear okay. what you have to say, okay? All right, This thank is you. what Rose is about. Okay, okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm uh, happy to take questions if there are sure. questions. I'm gonna have a couple of questions. I have Elizabeth who wants to make a statement first. I just wanted to clarify for the board what the issue is before you today. There were two issues, uh, two determinations made by the hearings examiner. One was on, um, what's called the SEPA review, the State Environmental Policy Act review for a project, they have to have a uh, SEPA determination made. And that's what um, Mr. Townsend has referred to at the very end of his argument. That issue about the MDNS, the SEPA determination of a mitigation determination of non-significance is not before you today. The reason that that particular decision of the hearing examiner is not before you is because our county code says appeals of the MDNS must go from the hearings examiner up to the superior court. The issue that is before you today is the actual shoreline development permit. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. For the Great. Thank you so much. I'll ask Commissioner Hutchins if he has any questions, then I'll have questions. Uh, not at this time. I don't. No, sir. <clears throat> Yeah, I have one um, question, if you can clarify for me, please. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to about the mid-part of your statement there, that uh, recreational uh, economy is more beneficial than the uh, agricultural economy that we're talking about. Uh, can you just kind of give me an idea how much recreation is going on in that area in terms of uh, volume and traffic, <coughs> uh, and types of kayaking, whatever it is? Can you give me a picture of what kind of recreation is going on? Sure. Um, I'm referring to, of course, the Earth Economics Report on the comparison of the value of, of uh, recreation to Puget Sound as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, recreation of all types happen here. We have people renting kayaks and canoes uh, and stand-up paddle boards uh, from the marina. They bring them uh, to uh, people bring their own gear and launch out of the public uh, uh, area right next to the marina. And they... Uh, come right around to Zangle Cove. We see them every day. And usually there are often groups of 8 to 10 to 12, sometimes folks. Sometimes they'll come around and like sit in the cove and train, tipping over and getting back up in their, in their kayaks. So um, there are thousands of rentals uh, from uh, Boston Harbor Marina uh, between uh, the, in their season, between April and September. So th yeah, the seasonal, what, what months were those? I didn't catch it. Well, between, they, they consider the season uh, between April and September. Mm -hmm. These are our longer days. Uh, and it's a steady stream uh, through the area. I think they said at one point there were like you know, 20 rentals a day on average. 
and, um, and they come and they direct them over to Zangle Cove. So they, as we're sitting on our deck, they're, they're streaming by um, on a regular basis. So the bulk of them are from April to September? Basically, yes. Okay, sure. uh, yeah, there are exceptions. I mean, there are the hardy souls who are out in the middle of winter yeah. <laughs> braving. Well, that's going to do with that. Braving sure. the weather. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Hutchins now has a question. I, I have two questions, Mr. <coughs> Townsend. Yes, um, uh, Taking copious notes, you have a, bring up a lot of, uh, a lot of issues. Uh, I thank you for that. Number one, you were talking about 84 uh, percent of the time uh, uh, the farm would be visible. Is that from 4 to 9 a.m. or p.m.? Well, that's from, uh, Commissioner, I just want to clarify that, 84% of the days. Of the days, I'm sorry. Yeah, of not the of day. the time. That of the a, day. That would be excessive. But no, 84% of the days. That's between uh, sunrise and sunset. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. And, uh, um, and you, you brought up a point that Thurston County, we don't know how many gooey duck farms exist out there uh, in the area. Uh, and you, you suggested or purported that Thurston County should know how many are out there and permit them. Well, that's the l law as I understand it in Thurston County. I'm not an attorney. But uh, these operations require uh, permits and a permit process, as Dr. Sun is going through right now. But uh, in testimony uh, in the hearing, it became clear that uh, the county did not know that there were some operations very close by. Yeah, very close by, you know, easy. 10 minute walk from where we are on the beach uh, that are unpermitted apparently uh, for the county. So uh, in testimony, the county said they did not know how many of these operations exist um, and it's a complete unknown, which goes to cumulative impacts. I mean, we're talking about a death of a thousand cuts uh, here. If we don't know how much there is, we can't possibly understand the cumulative <coughs> impacts of these kind of operations. I, I understood. But you suggested that we should, we should permit them? Uh, I would suggest that any operation should be properly permitted and go through the process uh, to do that. Uh, clearly, that's not happening. Uh, there's not a monitoring, uh, as, as it was uh, uh, said in testimony, there's not a monitoring function within the county to look for and identify these. And, and the, the county relies on citizen input on these kind of things. So um, we know, I, I happen to know that there are at least four operations and five parcels that are apparently not permitted. The county says they have no knowledge of them. How many more are there? Uh, it's just unknown. It's just an un, it's a unknown. All right. Thank you, sir. Sure. I have one more thing. Um, uh, I took a lot of notes, but I was wondering if you would submit your, uh, your testimony to the county so that we can see that for a later review. Is, there, is that a possibility? Certainly, Commissioner. Okay. We'd be glad to do that. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, prepared. Yeah. <laughs> and, sir, you're up next, and state your name, and you have the floor. Good morning. Rick Peters appearing on behalf of Thurston County. I'm with the Prosecuting Attorney's Office. First, as just a matter of housekeeping, um, I, I realize a large volume of information has been presented. This is a closed record appeal, so anything that's not part of the appeal portion contained as an exhibit should not be considered by the board. Okay. Um, so I just want to I want to caution the board on that because quite a few statements that were made are not actually contained in the appeal as well in the last argument. Very well taken. And Thurston County doesn't have a dog in this fight other than to support its staff in making the determinations that it made. Um, the evidence primarily provided at the hearing in front of the hearing examiner was from the appellants and from the applicants. But I do want to point out a couple items that are consistent with the determinations that Thurston County made under SEPA that were subject uh, to the shoreline approval. First of all, in the conclusion, the hearing examiner number one, um, or actually number two, under the shoreline substantial development permit, the hearing examiner found um, that the farm is consistent with the Shoreline Management Act, that aquaculture has been identified by the Washington State Legislature, the Governor's Office, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the Shoreline's Hearings Board as an activity of statewide and national interest that is preferred water-dependent use of the shoreline that can have beneficial environmental effects. Um, the Shoreline Master Program encourages aquaculture. Uh, and this um, is one of the bases for uh, the county stance in, in issuing the MDNS and, and, and essentially um, not opposing with conditions this permit. Second, I want to point out, and then I'll, I'll retire for the, the substantive argument, 
um, is there's been some discussion of cumulative impacts of other gooey duck farms. And in um, Hearing Examiner Shoreline Substantial Development Permit Conclusion G, um, she correctly states that cumulative impact analysis is not required for shoreline substantial development permits pursuant to the Shoreline Management Act or the Shoreline Master Program for the Thurston Region. The Shoreline Hearings Board has concluded that each gooey duck aquaculture proposal must be reviewed on the merits of its own site. So I just wanted to point those two matters out and then I'll, I'll retire now and, and leave the rest of the time to the applicant. Thank you, Commissioners. My name is Jesse D. Nike, and I am representing uh, applicant Dr. Chang Mook Son. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot of strong, sweeping statements about this farm and its potential incompatibility with this neighborhood, but we haven't heard a lot of details as to how that actually or purportedly will occur. I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about this specific proposal, the laws that regulate it, and the extensive environmental review that the county has been undergoing for this farm since 2014. So this farm is proposed by Dr. Chang Mook Song. Dr. Chang Mook Song moved to the United States from Korea and obtained a doctorate in economics. He served under five different governors as the executive director of the Economic and, Re and Revenue Forecast Council. De he dedicated his professional career to public service. Yet he always had, a cr had an interest in growing food. Upon his retirement in 2008, he turned his attention to that interest and discovered that his private tide lands are suitable for growing gooey ducks. That's what this, this case is all about. Dr. Sohn wants to grow native shellfish on his private intertidal property. This is a use that is not only allowed, but is encouraged under federal, state, and local laws and regulations. Dr. Sohn's farm is using all best management practices and is highly conditioned and regulated at the federal, state, and local level through the Substantial and Substantial Development Permit, through mitigated, uh, condi mitig mitigating conditions in the MDNS. There is no eelgrass on this property. There is no eelgrass in the vicinity. Uh, the only eelgrass that's been noted is, is in a tenuous state over 300 feet away. No agency requires buffers in that length of distance. Nobody has made any, nobody has made any determination that a buffer is, uh, is expected or required for this farm. There's just simply nothing to, <laughs> nothing to provide any buffers from. The gear will only protrude a few inches from the <coughs> substrate. It will not be located on the upper portions of the beach. This farm is only going to plus three mean lower low water, so it's not in the upper tidal area. Active farm activities where workers are actually out there planting, harvesting, things like that. It was estimated that that will occur less than one one hundredth of one percent of the time during the six year culture cycle. This is a very long culture cycle, very limited amount of active activities. The gear itself will be present for approximately six percent of the daylight hours over the total culture cycle. Turning to this appeal, uh, you, the, the, the board is sitting in an appellate capacity. The, the, the board reviews the hearing examiner's decision using a high amount of deference. Her factual findings can only be, be overturned if they've, they've essentially been shown to have no supporting evidence. This is a substantial evidence standard. Her conclusions of law are reviewed under the clearly erroneous standard, <coughs> which means that you must be left with a definite and firm conviction that a mistake has been committed. In the testimony today, in the briefing, you've been presented with no evidence or argument that any of her factual findings or conclusions are erroneous. I don't believe there was a single reference to a factual finding or a conclusion of law in the hearing examiner's decision in the argument before you today. The, the opponents are simply bringing up points that they've raised again and again and again over the last three years. Again, county staff has been reviewing this application since 2014. They have reviewed a volume of literature, both site-specific to this particular farm, as well as general relating to aquaculture. The hearing examiner considered this farm over three days of hearing. She heard testimony from numerous witnesses, both for the applicant, the county, and the appellants. She spent an extensive amount of time reviewing that information and drafting a very thorough, thoughtful decision. I believe it's 57 pages, includes 95 findings. If you look at those findings, every single one ties back to several pieces of evidence. Her conclusions of law are very thorough, supported by each finding. They all contain uh, citations to those findings. It's a very thorough, thoughtful decision. The hearing examiner very carefully considered all of the information that was submitted to her. In the oral argument before you today, appellants raised testimony that their experts provided 
uh, issues of eelgrass, aesthetics, recreation, and plastics. I'm, I'm frankly very surprised to hear that. Those are all issues that were raised on the SEPA appeal. The SEPA appeal is not before you today. Regardless, eelgrass, there is none, none at this site. Experts for the applicant testified that there is no potential for this farm to adversely impact any eelgrass in the area. Plastics, again, experts testified regarding the potential use of plastics. There are mitigated conditions in the MDNS as well as the, as well as the permit to make sure that the use of plastics is, is done responsibly and with the, with the proper materials. All of the tubes are being secured in place with an area net with rebar that will not only help protect the juvenile gooey ducks, but it will also help ensure that, that tubes, if they do become dislodged during storm events, don't escape from the site. It will also help reduce the aesthetic impact of, of the proposal. I believe 51 issues were raised before you in appellant's appeal. Uh, as, as we say in our response brief, most of those issues either relate to the SEPA de decision, which is not before you, or raise issues that are frankly outside, outside of the decision that is, that is being raised. Opponents do allege noncompliance with the Shoreline Management Act, uh, Shoreline Regulations, and the Washington, Washington Administrative Code, and the Shoreline Management Program for the Thurston Region. As detailed in our brief, uh, aquaculture, gooey duck aquaculture, is not only a preferred, but an encouraged and even protected use under all of those laws and programs. Uh, they also argue cumulative impact analysis should be, form, be performed. Uh, first off, there's no requirement in the SMA, shoreline regulations, or your shoreline master program for cumulative impact analysis for, uh, for shoreline substantial development permits. The Shoreline Hearings Board has, has stated that in some cases it may be appropriate to do that as documented in our response brief and as documented in the decision, those, those factors aren't triggered here. But even if it were appropriate to consider cumulative impacts, as stated in the decision, a cumulative impact analysis for all existing and new shellfish farms in Washington State over the course of the next 20 years has recently been performed by the federal, uh, federal resource agencies with expertise over this. That, farm or that analysis applies to this farm, and there's been no documentation or, or, or compelling argument that any sort of additional cumulative impact analysis is warranted. Uh, appellants challenged the hearing, hearing examiner's analysis of aesthetic in, impacts. Again, the, the hearing examiner considered all of this information. Uh, the, the gear will only be present for approximately 6% of the total daylight hours. It will be completely gone after two years. So, so four years out of the total six-year cycle, there will simply be no gear present. The, the only activity that will be occurring during that time is, is very occasionally workers walking along the tide lines, uh, gauging growth, gooey duck growth and, and predation and things like that. Um, uh, uh, further, as, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there are conditions in the MDNS and the permit that are designed to minimize the potential aesthetic impacts of this farm. The appellants have made no demonstration that those in, that those conditions are inadequate in any way, their position simply is this farm shouldn't go in place. They don't want it here. Um, moving on to, to some of the, the final items. Um, there was a discussion about native gooey ducks in the ground and, and bed preparation and, and going in and, and what they call clear cutting. That is not part of the proposal. I believe what the opponents are referencing is tribal harvest rights to go in and harvest uh, a certain share of native shellfish populations. That is a right that tribes have regardless of whether this farm is proposed. They can go out and do that under normal, normal course. That is not part of this proposal. Appellants claim that here an examiner erred in not citing certain comment letters or not notice, noting how many comment letters were submitted in opposition to the farm. First off, that's simply not correct. The hearing examiner actually included appendices where she listed every single comment, demonstrating how thorough her analysis was and that she did carefully consider all this information. What Appellant's real complaint is, is that she did not, did not deny the project on that basis. The hearing examiner committed no error there. Permit decisions cannot be made on the basis of public opposition or displeasure. This issue is crystal clear in case law. The hearing examiner carefully considered public comments, care carefully considered public input, carefully considered all the information, but she appropriately found that the farm is an encouraged, allowed use, and that this farm is using the appropriate management practices, has appropriate conditions in place to make sure it's appropriately managed uh, and run. Their reply brief and, and in comments today, they focus a lot 
on, on public opposition. Um, again, that's something that cannot be a, a basis for overturning or denying a permit. Um, in their reply brief, they also focus on the fact that they're not attorneys and shouldn't, should be granted some level of leniency on, on, on that basis. To be clear, they were represented by counsel through the entire stage. They may, may not be represented now, but any suggestion that they're going it alone is simply not, not accurate. But more importantly, the appeal should, not, should be denied not because they failed to meet certain technicalities. It should be denied because they fundamentally failed to show that the hearing examiner made any error. They clearly disagree with the hearing examiner's decision. They clearly do not want this farm in place. But that is not a basis for denying the permit. This is an allowed use. The, the farm has been carefully analyzed over years by county staff, by the hearing examiner. They've looked into all these issues, including recreation. I, recreation was an issue that was brought up quite a bit. The, there was no testimony during the, during the hearing or any public comments to show an actual impact. The gear sticks up a few inches from the substrate. There was very clear testimony, photographic evidence during the hearing that kayakers can, can use the, the waters overlying the farm uh, at high tide, using kayaks, using other boats, things of that nature. There was very clear testimony and documentation that there is no actual impact there. Concerns are, are not equivalent to impact. Appellants have raised a lot of concerns. They failed to demonstrate impacts. Um, and for that reason, we respectfully request that you affirm the permit and deny the appeal. Thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, Commissioner Hutchins, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, may I get your last name again, please, Jesse? Yeah, D Nike. D E N I K E. Okay, good, 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 right. Thank you. And. Uh, Nope, I don't. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Sure. Um, I want to go back to the statement you made, uh, no plastics after two years um, and that fault process. Can you just, maybe it's just procedural, but maybe, can you clarify for me why that is after it won't be plastics after two years? Sure. Mm -hmm. the, the plastics are in there for the purpose of predator protection. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're put in there to, to protect the juvenile gooey ducks from predation when they're their most vulnerable stage. Um, they're first planted and they're in the upper portions of the substrate. They're highly susceptible to predation. That's why sure. gear is required. After, after two years, uh, gooey ducks are typically able to dig down to a depth such that they, they do not require that gear anymore because mm -hmm. um, the gear is no longer required. Um, it's removed. And, uh, and and there's a condition in place, I, th I believe, in the MDNS to make sure that happens at uh, no later than two years. Okay, and then, but yet it's a six-year process. Is that do I have that statement also correct? Yes, so gooey duck four years. They're they're living on their own without the plastics. That's exactly right. Gooey duck gooey duck culture typically takes between five and seven years, depending on a number of environmental conditions. Um, and people smarter than me with with gooey duck culture have taken mm -hmm. a, a precise look at this site and said. You know, you can't say with 100% certainty, but, but they anticipate the grow cycle will, here will be six years. Okay. You have a question? I didn't know how to word that, but that's where I wanted to go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then the plastic is removed, the, the tubing, and the netting and the rebar? Oh, yeah. Is it's all, all removed then? All gear is removed after two years. And for reharvesting, they, it does it itself? They don't have to put, uh, they don't have to reinsert any more tubing and all that? For every culture cycle? The, they have to, they go through the same process once again. The same so, process each time. Exactly, okay. yes. All right. Yes. Thank you, sir. Anything from you, Elizabeth? Okay, sure. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. At this point, uh, you've heard the oral arguments for the appeal by Patrick and Catherine Townsend and Annika Jensen for uh, the Shoreline Substantial Development Permit issued to Mr. Son for a gooey duck agricultural ap operation. I'd like to thank everyone here today, and the board will issue their written decision on or about May 22nd, and we are adjourned.